Um, I'm Julie Samuels. I uh, run an organization called Tech NYC. You are not here to hear from me, so I'm going to start with Brewster Kale. Hi, I'm Brewster Kale. I started and run the Internet Archive and doing this stuff for a long time. Um, but I think we should talk about fake news, well, hold misinformation, on, Brewster. We're going to get to fake news. First, oh, we're going right. <laughs> to hold on, okay. hold on. <laughs> we're just getting started. First, Brewster, can you just give everyone a couple seconds on who you are, how you got here, and and then we're going to talk about what the Internet Archive is. Sure. Um, so I've been at this for a, a, a long time. The idea was to try to build the Internet. The, the vision that I signed on to is to try to build the Internet into the Library of Alexandria for the digital age. Can we make it so that there's universal access to all knowledge? Can we make it so that all the published works of humankind would be available to anybody? And believe it or not, been at this since 1980. And we had to basically get uh, a bunch of things going like computing and then the internet and then a system that eventually became called the web um, to to go about uh, all of this. And um, by sort of mid 90s, we got publishing online. And um, if I have one real regret before I sort of left the for-profit world, having sold a company to AOL and then to Amazon, it was not putting in place a business model other than advertising. I helped build the first advertising-based website, but also, um, which is assumed CMG, but also the first website for uh, subscription, which was the Wall Street Journal, uh, and going and putting these things online. But we didn't get a royalty model in place. Um, but anyway, um, by 1996, um, things were going along okay, so I shifted full-time to go and try to build the library, um, a non-profit library called the, uh, the Internet Archive, um, and that's... So talk to us a little bit more about what the archive is, you know, what, what, it, what do you guys do at the Internet right. Archive? So it, what we strive for is if Wikipedia is the encyclopedia of the Internet, We'd like to be the library of the internet. Um, the idea of how many people have used the Wayback Machine? Okay, awesome. Hey, uh, great. About half, maybe. Um, uh, so we've um, the idea was to archive every web page from every website every two months to try to basically take a snapshot of every web page and record it and make it uh, so that you can retrieve it again. And it's starting to get big. We collect about 800 million pages every day. It's just at a scale that's a little hard to comprehend. But uh, So we, we gather these things up. But the Internet Archive tries to take all the things that are analog, digitize them, and put them online. And it tries to take all the things that are already digital, like the web or television, and make it permanently accessible to anybody that wants to have access to it. And if that's not hard enough as a combination, we're trying to work on re-architecting the web in such a way that it's not as centralized and doesn't have some of the problems that, frankly, we're suffering from now. So building a more decentralized web uh, that makes it so that it's more reader-oriented than just publisher-oriented. You know, one of the things that I really found shocking, I've always found surprising, and, and it came up again when we were talking about this, is, is just how much... Uh, stuff isn't on the internet. I, I don't think people really understand the yes. scale uh, of the project that you're dealing with. Right. People, there's usually this sort of, oh, there's way too much information. It's all there. Uh, it is the library. Um, and actually, I feel really pretty guilty. Um, we conned everybody into not going to the library anymore, but turning to your screen to answer questions. And we basically had this promise that it's going to have the information there for you. But in fact, it's actually not true. If things that um, you're uh, dealing with that you know a lot about, the Internet's actually pretty thin. There may be a Wikipedia article on sort of everything, but it's all pretty thin. Um, so when we looked at what was on the Internet uh, in terms of historical information, um, or even the World Wide Web and those sorts of things that are persistently, the average life of a web page is only 100 days before it's changed or deleted. The Library of Congress was supposed to collect television, but they didn't. Um, when we uh, look at the books that have been digitized and put online by decade, it goes up, up, up to 1923, and then craters. And the, basically, the 20th century is not online, and it starts to come up at the end of the uh, 20th 
uh, century, and then by the beginning of the 21st century, we're about where we were in 1923. It's horrible. And if you take a look at what's available on Amazon, the books you can buy, it goes up 1923 by decade, and then craters again, and is not available. The 20th century fundamentally is not available to digital learners. And the 20th century was kind of an important century to not forget. Uh, and um, But it's not there. Um, and so it's it's uh, it all feels like it's, you know, there's so much information, but it's in fact fairly thin. So we didn't deliver on the promise of the hyper-connected docuverse of Ted Nelson or Tim Berners-Lee. It's a good idea. We haven't delivered it. And we're in 2019. And I'd say some of the information... 2020. Uh, 2020. Um, <laughs> I'm living in the past already. Um, is uh, Of disinformation, misinformation... Actually, I would say stems from some of those issues as well as some of the things you've probably been hearing more about. You know, you guys, we, Brewster brought props. He brought uh, some props. So I, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about some of your favorite things that have been digitized because I think there's this idea, you know, when you talk about putting things that are not native digitally on the Internet, what does that look like? Uh, well, this is a, a, a wax drum recording. Um, and actually just... Recently, because there was a law passed late last year that actually made it so that it's going to be in the public domain pretty soon, uh, which is kind of awesome. Um, it's got a picture of Edison on the cover. Um, it's all about Edison. You, if you've missed the Edison, then here's a picture of him, Edison. It's, it's all about him. Uh, 78 uh, and the like. But I'd say the uh, other things that I've really enjoyed about seeing these things come up is things like newspapers from Turkey. Um, which before they were uh, massively taken down, we were tipped off by some of the Turkish publishers saying uh, things aren't going well. And so we did a very active um, uh, crawls of all of their archives so at least they're somewhat available because now we've gotten it so that there's only one place that things live. Um, so if you can take that one place down or put a barrier in front of it, then uh, it can be uh, take, taken away. Can you also talk a bit about the TV News Project, which I think is, is a really fascinating example of how the Internet Archive does incredibly meaningful work? So we, you guys probably know us mostly as the Wayback Machine, but we've also been uh, collecting since the year 2000 television, Russia, Chinese, Japanese, Iraqi, Al Jazeera, BBC, CNN, ABC, Fox, 24 hours a day, DVD quality. Um, so go to tv.archive.org, um, and we've put... U.S. television news up in such a way that you can search on what people said and be able to record it. If you can't quote something, I have kids in school, so if you can't quote something, you can't then compare and contrast, and that's the elements of having uh, critical thinking. You have to be able to hold on to something. If you can't hold on to it, then it just flows over, and people can just, well, make things up. And guess what? People are just making things up. And, and we can now have actually proof of that because we're recording this. We're taking all the, the closed captions that were there for the deaf, um, and we're using that for search terms. But you can also go and do analysis of, of things at the, at the big scale. I like the line by Jesse Osabel, humanity got a long way by having a microscope. What if we could have a macroscope? allow you to step back and get an idea of what's going on. So some of the things that are going on with this television archive um, is you can search and ch see the differences between the different channels, and they are really very different. Um, you can start to quantify the bubbles that people live in. Um, you can also um, find all of the ads. We studied the ads um, in the battleground states. Um, we, we collected all of the television in um, 20 battleground areas leading up to the 2016 election and found all of the advertisements. And then we tried to figure out who paid for them and then who paid for them. Um, to try to, and it is astonishing. You have no idea what it's like to be in Iowa. It is the flood of money post Citizens United is, at, uh, it's, it makes it to the blanket of, of advertisements. What's, I, I find that generally frightening. But what's even worse is the amount of money that it's going to be starting to be redirected to try to corrupt the Internet. Um, so the, uh, the levels of money that are going into campaign 
um, uh, funding is at such an extreme that almost any medium is going to be um, massively uh, bought and, and, and sold. So we could actually understand that by doing real analysis of this. What we'd love to do is make it so that it's not just useful to, to journalists and the like, but to make it average citizens to be able to step out of their bubbles and be able to take a macro view. We haven't been able to build that yet. We still have these micro-targeted, whether it's cable news just started it, but the Facebooks and the Twitters, they can make your own little ecosystem just for you. Um, and that is frightening, um, very difficult to study. We're trying. Um, but this sort of thing is coming. How do we go and make it so that those that don't want to be in a bubble can get the multiple points of view on particular subjects? That's, I think, uh, an opportunity that we have by doing aggregation of these large-scale media collections. Uh, that's actually a perfect segue. We're going to get to disinformation, um, which I promised you we'd get to. I want to talk a little bit about kind of how you see the problem and how you've seen it shift since you launched the archive in 96. And I know we'll, there's an amazing project going on right now with Wikipedia, and I hope you can kind of fill, fill the room in on that as part of this. Um, it wasn't supposed to turn out this way. Um, really, we, we, we built something that was really for something else. We didn't build in some of the defense mechanisms. The first wave was really spam. Um, and that was sort of took us by surprise, and we didn't have the, the structures for going and weeding that stuff out. Then there was the commercialization of the uh, Internet through advertising and just e-commerce everything. Um, so that sort of wave uh, came through, and now we have these very large central organizations, the Facebooks, Twitters, Googles, uh, uh, Apples, that are controlling whole uh, media ecosystems. So things are, are kind of wobbling and going kind of, kind of wrong. Um, the, uh, right after the last election in 2016, and independent of who you wanted to be uh, president, but what happened during uh, that whole structure was a train wreck. Um, and it was a train wreck from uh, the internet perspective. I live in Silicon Valley. I'm very much embedded in that. None of us were proud that basically things were going wrong and we didn't quite know what to do about it. So after the election, I gathered the executive directors. I formed a little club, the executive directors of some of the open organizations, Wikipedia, Mozilla, the Internet Archive, Electronic Frontier Foundation, Freedom of the Press Foundation, Public Library of Science. And we get together every so often, mostly to, to have executive director therapy, you know, just sort of complain about things, whatever. Um, but at some points, we have to get together to say, what do we do now? And this was one of those evenings. I called them together and said, it's time to have dinner, folks. And so we got together and we said, what do we do now? One, what just happened? Another, how responsible are we for this train wreck? Um, and what do we do now? And I said, I'd put the Internet Archive on the table. I've got an army of 150 people. We're, we're giving a tax de deduction. We're here for the public spirit and the public good. What should we do now? And there's a bunch of conversation. And, um, but at the end of the evening, Catherine Maher, the executive director from uh, Wikipedia, she said something that frightened me. She said she was worried that truth might fracture. That sounds awful. Uh, what does that mean? She said that Wikipedia is based on the idea that on any particular subject, there'll be a consensus. There'll be pushes and pulls, but there'll be a consensus on any particular subject. There won't be completely alternative truths around a subject. So that would be bad um, uh, if, if Wikipedia came apart that way. If there's something we really count on, it's some kind of uh, a level of something you can count on, it's Wikipedia. And she said, the, I said, how would this happen? And she told me something that I'd never heard before. She said, citation wars. Citation wars. What? Citation wars. She said, behind every article, people are fighting to go and put different assertions into Wikipedia articles. And the way that you win those edit wars is based on the weight of your citations. If your citations are stronger or better, then you win. They bias towards things you can click on and see. So they basically, um, things get more weight if you can click on and see them. And a lot of the things you can click on and see aren't the best we have to offer. 
a lot of the paid propaganda sites, the blogs, just whatever, um, are, are all often freely available and promoted, but books or journal literature um, are not. So I, I turned to her and I said, okay, Catherine, I will dedicate my organization to fixing that, that we're going to take the org, uh, Internet Archive and go and reinforce Wikipedia as fast and best as we can. So what we did is we went through and we found all the hypertext links in the footnotes, and we tried to find which ones were broken. And we took the broken links and we went and found whether they were in the Wayback Machine and turned them into a Wayback Machine link. We fixed 11 million broken links. So the idea was to try to make it so you could actually click through because the average life of a web page is only 100 days. So we fixed 11 million broken links. Then we tried to find all of the books that were referenced. And we want to basically prioritize digitizing those books. We digitize now about 3,000 books a day. We digitize about a million books a year. You say, didn't Google do that? And they actually did do a good job. But they got tied, tied up in copyright crap, and it basically is not very useful. You know, little snippets and stuff. So um, the idea on these is to be able to click on a link, and if it's a page number, it goes right to the right page. So the idea is those footnotes are all live to books. And the next is journal literature. The idea is to go and make it so you can do fact-checking, both by people and then automated fact-checking to be able to find bias um, as it gets to be woven into Wikipedia, but also into the whole rest of the web. It's make the web a citation place. It's what it, the original dream of it was, but we didn't do it. And the reason why we didn't do it was copyright fears and policy problems, institutions not doing the right thing and stepping forward, and not putting ourselves into the digital world. I just, um, so the Internet Archive is a nonprofit in San Francisco. Our budget is about $18 million a year. To give you a context, the San Francisco Public Library, awesome group, is 10 times that. We're about the, the, um, the budget of Alameda Public Library. So even Wikipedia has a smaller budget per year than the San Francisco Public Library. So we in the policy or in the uh, areas of budget, uh, we're not investing in the systems that people are using to depend on what it is that's, that's going on. Uh, and so there are a lot of these uh, organizations that build up the Internet that you may not think of as we sort of complain about the big boys. Um, I also want to make sure we have a second to talk about decentralization because at the outset you kind of laid out the three things the Internet Archive does and decentralization was on that list. So I was hoping you could quickly address that um, and then we're going to do just a couple more questions up here and we'll, we'll open it up for a few minutes too. So start thinking. So the, the thought was on this web was everyone could be a publisher. Right? You could be your blog, you can control your own distribution, you can control the distribution of your work. Uh, wouldn't that be great? And it is actually pretty great. We have to sort of pause every so often and say, you know, actually a lot of this stuff works pretty well. I use Google Maps all the time, the miracle of Google Docs. There's um, uh, going and searching on all sorts of things, um, uh, being able to get to lectures, all, all, all terrific. But... We've left it such it can be very centralized in the sense that any particular set of material lives in one place. And we're starting to have a few organizations control whole media types, whether it's YouTube or Elsevier um, or these other organizations that control one media type. And if, if, if that either gets done, taken down or blocked or unsubscribed to or your person non grata, you're cut off from that. And that's not the way that it was. If you uh, remember back back in the old days, and some of us are old enough to remember libraries, they were, um, uh, libraries would buy books or periodicals from publishers, and even if they went out of business, those things would still be available. That's not the way it works now. Those, those companies make a different decision or go out of business or merge or whatever, um, then the whole thing disappears. So what we're trying to do is build a decentralized web. Make a peer-to-peer -peer backend for the web. So your web sites still look the same, but they're coming from multiple places. If one place goes down, you can still get it. If you're in some place blocked, um, say China or uh, Turkey, you can still get it. Um, that basically you get a peer-to-peer backend 
So it's uh, offered the same materials from multiple places. Uh, so Tim Berners Lee, Vince Surf, there's been meetings on this. It's coming from the, some of the decentralized crowd, such as the Bitcoin uh, communities. And the reason why I bring this up is it makes sense to do this. There's certainly going to be people in the status quo organizations that are going to go and say, oh, that's all horrible because it will encourage blank and put in your favorite fear word there. Um, and just like I was involved in the wars of the ARPANET versus AT&T or uh, the web versus the AOLs of the world, this is another one of those types of transitions that feels scary to those that are currently in charge, but we need a more decentralized system. Um, even Twitter is saying they want it more uh, decentralized, and the Internet Archive is trying to provide a, uh, a guiding light on how to do this uh, without being um, immediately corrupted. I'm going to ask you one more question, and then, like I said, we'll, we'll throw it out to the audience. Um, but I, in talking to you to prepare for this conversation, and also in the years I've known you, one of the things that is so refreshing is to hear the optimism. And in so many conversations right now around technology, uh, there's a lot of pessimism. Um, and, well, first of all, so thank you. <laughs> Let me start by saying thank you. But I was also hoping you could just talk for a couple seconds. You did already a little bit, but, but a little bit more about the things you see that are going right. Things are opening up in some ways. I, um, and actually, there was a good thing that happened in Washington. Let me tell you about it. Um, uh, it the public domain is expanding again. 1923 and now 1924 are in the public domain. You can share it and be awesome. It's kind of great. Um, that's a long time ago, but at least it's moving again. Um, but there was also, I think in the first time in my career, Congress made a law that expanded public access. <laughs> and it was the Music Modernization Act. Um, and it took the pre-1972 sound recordings that are out of print and made them so people can make... Uh, um, make them available. Libraries can go and, and digitize them and make them available. Um, and uh, there's a whole weird system for people going and saying it's out of print enough and blah, blah, blah. But the good news was the Music Modernization Act drew the line at 1972 and before and said, out of print, all good to go. So Boston Public Library donated their full sound archives to the Internet Archive. We're digitizing long playing records at a, that of clip um, and putting them on, online on the Internet Archive, um, but also uh, University of Illinois and on and on and on. So we're starting to, to dig, mass digitize. So there's some uh, law and policy aspects that are going right. Um, I don't think many of us want to go back to the old bad old days of having to slog to the library for uh, long hours to try to find the answer. So that's going okay. We're digitizing along. We're doing controlled digital lending. So you can go, and if we have a physical copy of a book, we digitize it and we lend it one reader at a time. It's sort of weird, but it's, um, you know, it's kind of restricted. Why do you do this? And it's basically to try to stay out of the way of commerce. So we've now digitized 1.2 million books. We're weaving them into Wikipedia, but they're being borrowed up a storm. So people are turning to better information than just a blog post or just a Wikipedia article about it. And I, I got the... Um, my, my next door neighbor, her name is Carmen Steele. She's 15 years old. Um, and I was describing uh, my, what I was doing, you know, digitizing this stuff and wiki, weaving it into Wikipedia. And she lit up. She said, I want that. Okay, I never get a rise out of my 15-year-old next door neighbor. She's just, you know, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But she said, I want that. I said, why do you want that? She said, oh, in my school, I'm not allowed to quote from Wikipedia in my papers. I have to go and find the, the book. And if I could do that, if I could just click on it and get right to it, I could do my homework in the middle of the night. It's like, <laughs> score. So, uh, so I knew that we were on to something uh, here um, to, to be able to make it so that we make it so that it's referenceable. How do we go and not just have Twitter, which are just, um, just un, unattributed quotes or little pieces of snippets of video, how do we make it so that it goes back to where it came from so you can see the context. All of that is within our grasp if we start to address this and, frankly, allow it to happen from a policy perspective um, that has often been driven by the status quo closing. So we have uh, closing off the options. If we allow the hypertext linking of the structures we 
did bef- um, that we dreamed of, we have one part of making a more reliable information resource that, frankly, we all turn to all the time. Uh, and some of it's actually happening. All right. Um, I think we've got a couple minutes for questions. There's a mic. Um, I okay. Uh, so, so why don't we why don't you go right there? Hi. Um, thanks for um, coming today. Um, you started to talk a little bit about restrictions in different parts of the world where uh, websites are blocked and different things are blocked. I assume you're blocked in some of those same We're places. We're blocked in uh, China, uh, occasionally in Russia, I think maybe in Turkey at the moment. Uh, yeah. I, I'm just wondering how you deal with this whole question where, where there are different countries where, like in Europe, they have the right to be forgotten. They have certain copyright legislation that's different from ours and how you're dealing with this and, and, and what you're trying to do in keeping, you know, the whole idea of the okay. Internet is keeping information open and, and accessible, and the same thing available to everybody. And I just wonder what's happening in that ecosystem now. So right to be forgotten, uh, what do you do about all of this? A lot of these laws are actually draconian and dreadful and are really directed at a few big players but they catch and sweep up a lot of small and medium-sized organizations, the word presses, the internet archives, uh, and the like. So where they were trying to address particular problems, they they make these these things that are are basically um, we're we're casualties of these other wars. So if we take, for instance, this this kind of awesome Edison recording, this thing up until uh, December would not be public domain until 2067. That's stupid, right? I mean, this it wasn't like there was somebody that went and said, oh, yeah, it's really important that nobody have access to this. But the Library of Congress, head of sound recordings, said they couldn't make things available until 2067. So there were a lot of organizations like the Library of Congress that just sat on unbelievably great collections and didn't do bupkis. We, on the other hand, digitized it all and put it all online. And we did this with also with 78 recordings. And you know what? Nobody whined about it. Um, if people do, then we talk to them and um, try to explain why it should be up. And if they still complain, we take it down. And, but that's something that we feel we can do uh, with 78s and, and cylinder recordings, but not the Library of Congress. So we end up with these um, rules that are put in place by lobbyists and, and folks that are trying to serve the public good from the perspective they're seeing, but they don't see these other perspectives. It's not like libraries have a lot of lobbyists. We just don't. Um, so we often don't even get our sides understood of how we're being affected. Um, but it is uh, sweeping and, and, and a problem. All right. Uh, we've got um, right over here. Combining two of the things that you talked about, the Internet Archive absorbing absolutely everything that you can, and the Wikipedia citation wars, the Archive will have everything, true and not true, misinformation, disinformation. How can future researchers distinguish the good from the bad and the good from the nonsense and the evil? Context. So how can you tell what, what you're looking at, what, if it's crap or not? It's how we teach our kids. It's how we learn as we are growing up. Um, it's w- what's the context of it. Sometimes that's a little hard to tell because things get disembodied from where they came from. But if you can then take something and find out where it did come from, that helps a whole heck of a lot. Um, so we're not uh, – we do collect uh, – we have a very good porn collection in the, uh, in the Wayback Machine, um, I think. I've never looked at it myself. Um, uh, But it's, and so we basically build up these large scale collections. We just try to provide uh, levels of information about what it is you're looking at. Um, And as a library, that's what we see our, our role as. Publishers make editorial decisions. Librarians try to collect and contextualize. I think we've got time for one more question. I saw a hand on this side. No? We've got a hand back there. We'll do one last question. Thank you um, so much for the Internet Archive. It's awesome. Um, But I was curious, like, if you could articulate kind of a vision from a content moderation perspective about 
just what you want to be in there. Because what I'm hearing is kind of like everything except for um, stuff that's illegal. Um, is that really what it is? Or is there... Okay. So content moderation, um, can I jump in? Uh, content moderation is usually an issue around some of these platforms that are putting things out more actively. So the Internet Archive is a record of them. So let me um, speak on things that I'm, I'm not running, these organizations that do uh, the, the Twitters and the Facebooks and the like. Those guys are in a really tough bind. Um, okay, I don't like some of the right? Some of the technologies are kind of crap. Um, but they, um, they're in a tough bind. Um, they built systems that were really designed to, to maintain small communities and keeping them uh, in touch with each other. You know, when is the soccer game? When, uh, how do you go and do these things? And based on their business models, they invited in celebrities and news and then political, larger-scale distribution of, uh, of information. I think that was a mistake. It was uh, very advertising-driven uh, uh, to be able to go and do these things. They make a lot of money. I mean, these uh, presidential campaigns alone are on the order of a billion dollars each that are going to be spent in the order of six months. The corrupting influences of that much money is something that most people's technologies cannot withstand. A much, uh, you, if we're starting to record radio, red state radio, and also um, uh, blue state radio, and it is wacky out there, um, and it is flooded with money. Um, to go and corrupt these systems. So if you're talking, just don't nail the, uh, the, the Facebooks and the like. There's a wider corruption of our, of our media ecosystems. So what do we do about it? Um, going and asking these guys to just take down bad stuff is really hard uh, it, for them to do. And it doesn't put them in the right positions, in fact. Um, so how? I think we try to build some of these platforms so that they do have references. So if they go and make it so that you're just mouthing off, you can tell. And that's easier to sort of know to ignore as a reader or as an editor on these platforms. Enable uh, communities to go and do their own um, uh, moderation as opposed to just saying, oh, Mark Zuckerberg, you fix it. Um, that's not a prescription that's going to work very well. We'll run out of, of ways of doing that. But I think we need also a bit more slack and investment in our digital infrastructure and ecosystem. The level, you know, as I said, the budgets on these things, they're tiny. The things that maintain our um, uh, underlying, not the Facebooks, those guys have big budgets, but the underlying internet infrastructure is massively underinvested in. Um, when There's a question, why is the internet archive an independent nonprofit. Why aren't we part of a university? Why, why aren't we part of a national lab? When I was growing up, that's where all this stuff was, but they aren't anymore. Why not? Uh, as we've now started to really depend on these systems, um, the funding for them is not, is not there. So I think the idea of just whacking Apple on the side of the head and saying, you fix it, uh, ain't gonna, it's not going to lead the results you imagine. Oh, there. The question oh, was: so the what, question was, what about content that sits on the archive? If, if there are illegal things on it, then we take it down, especially in the countries in which it's uh, illegal. So, if China had gone and said, "You can't have those videos up because it breaks our laws," we and we offered to just block it for those in China. They said, "No, it has to be blocked for everybody." We said, "That's not what we do." Um, so um, they blocked us. All right, we are out of time, um, but I really. I'm going to take my moderator uh, prerogative for a minute and say this has been such an honor because not only is the Internet Archive so amazing, but Brewster is also a hero of mine and getting to watch what he's built for the world and for all of us is just so amazing. So thank you, Brewster. Thank you. And thank you thank all you so Julie. much.